Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's AFPHM webinar. We have today we have Dr. Jonathan Mallow talking about critical appraisal. If anyone has any questions, um, we'll take them at the end of the session. You'll be able to use the Q and A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, please type your questions into there, and Jonathan will answer them at the end of the session. I'll now hand it over to Jonathan. Thank you. Great, thanks, Terrace. Um, thank you, Candice, Anthony, Alex, and 4003-1908 for joining. Um, so today, I'd just like to um, run through some critical appraisal stuff as um, found this is something that's really useful in both in public health practice and conducting research and, and um, for the exam. So I'll be asking you guys some questions um, during the during the webinar. I know you've got some ability to type out questions and, and answers, so I might have to pick on a few of you. So to get started, um, lots, as I said, lots of uses for critical appraisal. Um, I think conducting research when we develop, review, or interpret guidelines uh, in public health practice when we're peer reviewing um, manuscripts for, for a journal and for the public health um, final oral exam. So today what we'll um, cover is um, looking at some good resources for conducting critical appraisals of different study types. Um, let's look at some exam, uh, exam, example exam questions where critical appraisal um, is needed. Um, review, bias, confounding, and chance. Um, looking at different study types and what are the key questions to, to ask for different study types when they uh, when we're appraising them. Um, look at a few more resources and then some just general tips for the exam. Um, so there's this critical appraisal skills program checklist, uh, which that is the link for, which is really useful. Um, provides very simple to follow um, critical appraisal checklists for um, all the common study types. Um, so I'd highly recommend going through those. Generally, how they're structured are asking, are the results of the study valid? Just looking at what is the internal validity of the study results. What are the actual results? So both looking at the magnitude and size of the outcomes and whether or not those um, are statistically significant. And then how have those how might those results actually be of benefit? So looking at the um, generalizability, external validity of the study, uh, the applicability to the context uh, that, uh, that you might be trying to apply them in, um, as well as the cost benefits and, and harms from any um, recommendations or actions taken out of those. So going through um, some of the key components of internal validity, the key key parts of doing this is to, for each component, so whatever type of bias or when we're trying to look at confounding, is to think about how are you actually assessing that when, you, when you're reading the paper or you're looking at results and the methods, how things are conducted. Trying to think about what have the authors done to minimize or estimate what the impact of any bias for confounding might actually be. Um, so it's not just enough to say that you're gonna look for selection bias, it's, you know, it, you know, you have to actually look at what might they have done um, to address that. How likely is that impact um, to be? And then if there is any potential impact, is what, how might that actually affect um, the results um, of the study that we're looking at? So those are all the key things that we need to look at when we're looking at the different components um, as part of our critical appraisal. In terms of exam questions that are um, epi-like um, and where we might need to um, apply some of our critical appraisal skills. Um, so this includes, these are some common ones that I'm sure many of you have seen in looking at past exam questions or describe the findings in the graph or table. What might be some of the reasons and factors for this pattern of findings? What else would you like to know about the study design and analysis to fully evaluate the results? What factors would you take into account before forming a recommendation? What types of evidence might be available to you? What are the pros and cons of the different types of evidence that would be available? And describe how you would go about assessing the possible association. So looking at those, we can see a lot of things where when we're, if we're 
um, talking about the reasons and factors for pattern and findings or other things that you want to know. Clearly some um, the importance of critical uh, uh, appraisal, including that um, is fairly evident. So for example, if we look at what is the reason for this pattern of findings, just try this out. Candace, in five words, what is the reason for this pattern of findings? Are you able to type into here? Are you able to type somewhere where I could see? Chat, no, you can't type. You just typed to me, so of course you can type. Alex, can someone type? Mm. Less words, okay, so Candace has said time since diagnosis. So the re, in any, so similar if we can look at, here we've got a table where we've got um, relative risks of different things. Again, so what might be the reason for that? pattern findings or for those associations. Again, looking at, at another graph. If you, to be strictly you know, um, uh, precise and using epidemiology, the reason for any pattern of findings or any association is it could be due to bias, it could be due to confounding, it could be due to chance, or there could be a true association, and that could be causal or re reverse causal in nature. So. That is, is what I would recommend and what I would say, you know, any, um, if you're looking for any reason behind a pattern of findings, so those are the things that you should systematically think about um, when looking at any, um, any association or pattern or trends. So running through some of these things now. So to go talk about selection bias, so we'll do this in general and then we'll, and then I'll focus on some of the key study uh, how these might apply to, to some of the key study designs. So a selection bias, we want to know how were the participants recruited? Was it volunteer survey? Was it random? Was it, were they stratified according to any age or demographics? And then thinking then about how, how they might have been recruited. Are they then representative of the target population? So you know, there's issue, uh, people volunteer, those tend to be um, they might be worried well or healthy volunteers. Um, if it's surveyed, then we have to think about what was the response rate. If we're doing any type of longitudinal study, then loss to follow-up is the type of selection bias that needs to be considered. Okay, so those are some of the key things to ask in the selection bias. And then how do we actually do that? So, you know, we read that in the study, then one of the nice ways to do that when we've got, you know, if we're looking at a cohort study or a case control study or an RCT is to look at the table. There should almost always be a, um, a table um, in any paper or study that, that shows you general demographics of people of the cases and the controls or the treatment or the control arms. And then you should be able to look at those demographics and they should be at, at the start of the study and they should be relatively similar. So that's one easy and you know, practical way that you can express in terms of how you would be assessing um, any likelihood of selection bias. In terms of information bias, um, so really this is talking about misclassification and to, to think about it systematically, it's either misclassification of the exposure or of the outcome. And then we have to consider where any is any is that misclassification differential or non-differential. Sorry, computer's just being a little slow at the moment. Hmm. Okay. Then also consider, so we've looked at. So considering those things, and then look at how is the exposure outcome actually defined, and then how is it measured? So what was the actual definition or criteria for a certain exposure or outcome to be met? And how was that measured? Was it through self-reporting? Was it by uh, examine of pathological specimens, through death certificates, 
clinical measurements or assessments. Um, and then having a think about, well, how reliable do we think um, those particular measures might be? And consider um, the authors are, as part of the study design, were there any attempts to validate or increase the reliability of the exposure or outcome status? So this could be done by blinding of exposure outcome status to um, to anyone looking at the to anyone looking at the results or interpreting an, an outcome. Um, could have multiple um, assessors. So, for instance, if we're looking at pathological examination uh, specimens to determine um, a cancer outcome, then you could have uh, more than one pathologist independently um, make a diagnosis to help validate, and this is particularly important for um, retrospective studies, so case control studies or retrospective cohort studies, is trying to use records, so through clinical, prescribing, could be housing or employment records to, um, to try to verify what someone's um, exposure might have been. Now, to move then on to confounding, so just quickly, so we have to consider what potential confounders were identified in a study? Um, so usually there's always um, you know, provided in, in the methods of what those potential confounders were um, and, and um, how they came about. So it might be that the authors looked at previous literature or previous studies and considered what, uh, what were the potential confounders that they should measure. Um, and then how were they measured? Um, thinking again about um, um, similar things to exposure and outcome in terms of how those things are being measured and how reliable the measurements of the confounders are. And then how were these controlled for in the design or analysis of the study? So in the design of the study, this is done through either restriction, matching, randomization. In the analysis done, done through stratification or regression analysis. And then we also have to think about in terms of you know how well those potential confounders were identified and measured is they might be controlled through a regression analysis, but they have to be actually be measured and identified um, well um, in order to actually control for those confounding. So just because it, the authors have done something, there's always a potential for residual confounding um, to influence the results of the study. Just quickly going through uh, chance something that um, everyone's very familiar with. So we have to think about what appropriate statistical testing was used, looking at either p-values or confidence intervals. Um, and for small studies, particularly if there are non-significant findings, is uh, was the study powered um, sufficiently um, in order to detect the, the outcome uh, of interest? All right, moving on to different study types and the key questions that um, we need to uh, to ask when we're looking at these. So for systematic review and meta-analysis, Alex, could you type to me in the chat what some of the key questions you think might be for systematic review and meta-analysis? What study types are included? Good. Size of studies? Good. Consistency of findings? Great. I'll let you off the hook with those. Good. So those are all good ones. Other things, so we have to look at what are the what were the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the studies that were actually um, um, in terms of their search and uh, the study. So what was in, actually included, and, and is that appropriate? Is there anything missing? Um, assessment of the actual study quality. So just because there's lots of studies in that, the quality of the outcome or the meta analysis is only as good as the the quality of the studies that it actually includes. So. Generally, a good systematic review and meta-analysis will include some form of, of quality assessment of the different studies. And then there may be a sensitivity analysis uh, of the meta-analysis. 
that only includes the, the studies uh, of, the highest, of the highest quality to see if that's any different in the overall. Um, as Alex mentioned, so consistency of results, so which is looked at through heterogene heterogeneity. So at the bottom of um, the, um, of the forest plot, uh, had the previous one, and there wasn't one included there, but you often might see an I squared value and a P value associated with that. Um, which I'll leave it up to you to look at how to interpret those. Some assessment of publication bias, um, which is done through this, which is called funnel plot. Um, so another thing that's worth looking at to make sure that you're happy with, that you know how to interpret a funnel plot. Randomized control trial. Uh, Anthony, would you have any, what are some of the key questions that we might consider when, if we're looking at a randomized control trial? Do you be able to type that relatively quickly? A couple of ideas. Sample size, great. Stratification, great. Let you off there. Results, sure. So one of the key things that's often for you is just because something's a randomized control trial doesn't mean it's actually been randomized perfectly. And so know that Randomization controls for founders that are both known and unknown. If it's done, if randomization is done perfectly, so you actually have to look at how are that how are participants randomized. So is it done through block randomization? Um, and, make, and to make some assessment then of uh, again looking at that table at the start of a study, where if we're looking at the treatment and the control arms, if randomization was done really well, then all of those demographics should pretty much um, line up. Um, really well with another another, and we shouldn't look at we shouldn't find any significant differences between, um, for example, the the, you know, the age or, or the sex or other important demographics um, for the study type. So that's really important to, to actually assess how good and how are they randomized and how good is that randomization. Often these are longitudinal studies, so we have to consider what the loss to follow up is, um, and was that if there was loss to follow up, was that group um, that was lost. Were they any different to those, um, were they systematically different to those who remained in the study um, themselves? And so that's again, looking at the demographics of each. Or, and then things should be done in a randomized control trial by an intention to treat analysis. So that is often in uh, randomized control trials that happen in the real world groups might, um, people might be assigned to a certain group and then they might not complete the treatment or they might actually sw switch groups. An intention to treat analysis is where the analysis of the outcome, it's all done according to what the initial um, what initial group the participants were, were placed into. So it doesn't take into account when groups are switching across because that, that has a potential to introduce bias. Now prospective cohort, very similar to, um, similar to a randomized control trial in any longitudinal study. That's very important to assess and um, were those lost to follow up systematically different than those who remained in the study. And how were those people's results included in the study? So, for example, so if it's a 10-year follow-up and um, looking at outcomes and someone was went into the study for, for five years, it was what happens, you know, what, what outcome are they assessing at, at five years if they did or if they didn't have the outcome? Um, and that's generally called censoring. And also important to consider is there a sufficient length uh, of follow-up to actually um, for the outcome of interest. So, for instance, if we're looking at cancer survival or if we're looking at um, development of diabetes, cardiovascular outcomes, we need to actually have, the study needs to have a sufficient length of follow-up to actually detect whether um, there are actually going to be any differences. And so that's something that's, you know, that is subjective, um, but needs to be considered um, in relation to other similar studies. For case control studies, um, key things, so how are the controls selected? Were they selected from the same 
um, population um, as the actual cases themselves. What is the potential for recall bias? Note that so this is recall bias is often confused or, or, or poor is confused with poor recall. Um, people have poor recall. That's not recall bias. Recall bias is when you have a systematic difference um, between the recall of the two groups. So in case control studies, most often this is those that have the outcome uh, of interest. So um, uh, for instance, um, when if you're looking at case control study for a um, for an outbreak of a gastrointestinal illness, what would what generally happens when we get sick or we get um, a gastrointestinal disease is that we do a lot of thinking about oh what did we eat uh, the last few days what's made us sick and and really you know forensically go through all that we've eaten and you know we'll blame the chicken or the, the or the Burger King. But whereas the control group doesn't do that, um, and similarly for people that have um, that might develop cancer, if you look at um, cancer studies, they don't do a lot of thinking about all those possible exposures and the um, electric wires and you know all possible things they can think of that might um, that might have given them exposure. Whereas the, the control group hasn't done that same thing. So you have a systematic difference between um, the actual recall of certain exposures. Um, between the groups. Ways that we can actually control for that is doing a case-case analysis. So often, for instance, if we're looking at sal uh, say an outbreak of salmonella and we're doing a case and we want to do an analytical study, we'll use, so we've got our cases that'll be salmonella, but we might use other cases of say of another gastrointestinal illness, um, that's similar such as Campylobacter, so that there isn't that, um, so that it reduces that amount of, of recall bias in the actual study and it, and it makes it a lot easier to actually recruit controls into the study. Um, other ways you can do is actually look for it to try to, um, some methods of verification uh, of exposure. Uh, as I mentioned before, actually looking at um, um, records of, um, you know, there could be clinical records or any type of record that might actually help verify what someone's exposure status was. We might actually conceal um, what the purpose of the study is or provide an alternate um, study purpose to the participants. So it's not something where they're thinking about, you know, we're looking at the effects of this uh, or the exposures to do with this particular cancer. Um, give them something else so then they're not actually thinking about that. Cross-sectional studies, so we have to think again about how participants were actually sampled and what was the response rate um, to, to that. Okay, moving on and looking at some additional resources, um, I think that are very valuable for both critical appraisal and, and, and some of those scenarios that are put in the exam that are actual real world scenarios. Um, so the NHMRC has this evidence for um, guidelines and, and making recommendations that are really useful and provide a really good framework um, for how we might look at evidence in forming a recommendation. Um, made for uh, in, intended to be used for, for guidelines but I think is a really good um, framework uh, in order to think about some of some of these situations um, so it's really looking at what is the actual you know if we're trying to make a recommendation about something is what's the actual body of evidence for, for us to make a recommendation so looking at the overall evidence base what are the consistency of the study results uh, likely clinical uh, impact how generalizable um, the body of evidence is, and then how applicable that might be um, to, to an Australian setting. So this is just from, from that document, this is a table with, it's just a matrix, um, looking at, at, at how we might assess um, those five different components um, of the body of evidence. As part of that document as well, and this is something that's very important to be familiar with, is the, um, evidence hierarchy for the different different study types or different um, uh, with the different study types according to the actual um, type of research question being asked. And then finally some extra tips um, that I thought would be useful for people and you know in thinking thinking about the exam and the importance of critical appraisal um, that it's important to be systematic in, in your responses. These 
questions are often difficult if it just says discuss findings or, or do this, but it's important to develop a systematic way that you can actually approach these questions. Um, so that includes, so if we're looking at, uh, as I've said, if we're looking at reasons behind any um, pattern of results or, or trends that we look at chance, bias, confounding, true association, you start there, you know, that's the, the reason behind any of those things. We're looking at describing any you know, any results in a graph or, or in a table is, you know, just to be very basic and look at, you know, orientate. So what are we actually looking at? What are the size of the results and magnitude? And are there any obvious trends? And is there any um, measurement of significance results? Um, and then again, being very systematic, when you look at those, the types of research questions um, and the level of evidence to, if we're looking at, you're trying to look at uh, you know what study types you, that you identify, or what's the research question we're looking at. Well, these are the types of evidence that you know that, that would fall under that, and this is the hierarchy. Some things might not be you know there might not be a systematic review and meta analysis um, for every for every research question that they're asking. So to be very practical with that as well. Know your epi terms uh, and definitions. Um, it's very clear, I think, when I if we hear people speak and they you know, mix up terms like recall bias or, um, or, or other types of bias and confounding or when they're talking about significance results or confidence intervals and how to interpret that is to really know those very well and be confident um, that you know them. That's all, it was a bit short, but happy to open up to questions now. Hopefully that was useful. Does anyone have any questions? Can you please, Candice, explain the difference between effect modification and can, can you please explain the difference between effect modification and confounding? Thank you for that question, Candice. What you just talked to medical students this, so I think you should be able to, to explain that given you just taught them. So confounding, if we go back to the, the definition uh, of what is a confounder, it needs to be um, associated with the exposure independently associated with the exposure and with the outcome and not part of the, the causal pathway. Something that, um, and the way that we look at that confounding, again, we can look at it through stratification um, and we can look at, and we can assess that through, um, through regression analysis um, if we're looking at the, the study design. In terms of assessing effect modification, um, so this is something that's often done again. You can do this through stratification and you can do it through regression analysis by including often interaction terms um, with different elements in that. Why don't, uh, Candice is giving a talk on Friday. Why don't I talk with you offline, Candice, and help you come up with a clear way to explain that to medical students? You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Alex. I'll explain that to you after. Candice made a good point here in the exam that you should mention clinical significance, which yes, is certainly correct. Um, when talking about the results of the study, are they actually, is it something that's clinically significant? I agree. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up then. Hopefully this is a useful resource and it's been useful for those online and will be useful for those who 
watch this on YouTube later. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Jonathan. This is Carrie Clark, just stepping in. Oh. Hi, Carrie. Hi. If there are any other questions, they could be emailed to the AFM inbox and I'm happy to pass them along. Great. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks everyone for dialing in.